are going to talk about custom math libraries today, uh, how to build them, architecture for them. Uh, I am Sean Middleditch. I think most of you here know me already. But uh, So I am Game 200, Game 300 TA, uh, president of the Game Engine Architecture Club. Uh, currently a senior. Uh, a couple of my games you may or may not have seen, Subsonic and Core, and that is enough about me. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about how to build a math library. This isn't how to do math. I, I'm not a math person. I don't pretend to be. Uh, we got Math 140, 250, tons of graphics classes for that. This is how to build the code architecture that makes it easier for you to do the math in your game. Uh, make sure you have the nice easy APIs for using vectors and matrices and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to go over a little bit about API design, how to make your math library easy to use, easy to figure out. Uh, go a bit over testing, how to make sure your math library actually works. Uh, as well as just cover the tips and tricks and also optimization using SSE. All right, so first of all, there's the, kind of this question about why even bother writing a custom math library when there's already so many great math libraries out there. Uh, one reason is for consistency. Uh, a lot of the external math libraries don't look or feel anything like your code. They don't use the same methods of interacting with them. If you're using, for example, the DirectX math library, it's all kind of written as C structs and these global functions. And if you're writing this high, heavily object-oriented code, it's going to look kind of alien. It just feels weird, looks out of place. Not a huge point, but some people really like to stress having internally consistent code. A second reason is speed. Some math libraries, like the DirectX math library, are quite highly optimized. Quite a few other libraries are not optimized at all, and honestly, you guys can do a lot better with a little bit of time. Uh, again, this, this is usually one where out in the, the professional world, you're going to have plenty of math libraries available to you. But there are cases where you possibly can do something a little bit faster, especially in certain circumstances. You know, the reason is features. A lot of math libraries are designed around a particular feature set that maybe is not the exact feature set you need. The DirectX math library, for instance, is all built around DirectX. And while there's a lot of compatibility between OpenGL and DirectX in terms of math, there's a few things as an OpenGL programmer you might feel like you're missing, perhaps. Uh, same way for some of the OpenGL-oriented libraries don't feel quite right for DirectX. And neither of the graphics-oriented libraries really feel good if you're trying to do physics programming. Uh, so it, it's really helpful to just kind of have this broad base of functionality available to you that is generally only available in these very, very large, heavyweight, not super well optimized for games libraries. Uh, another reason is portability. If you are using DirectX Math and you decide you want to port your game to iOS, you're going to be in a bit of trouble because DirectX Math only works in DirectX platforms, which is not iOS. Uh, running it from scratch gives you the capability to just port your code whenever you want, however you feel like, at any time for any reason. Uh, just gives you a lot more control. And last reason, and this is not a good reason, uh, but the not invented here syndrome. Really common amongst those programmers. We didn't write it. We don't want to use it. We're going to use the one we wrote ourselves. As a student, this is actually kind of a good thing. Um, it, it's just a good learning, learning exercise. You can, you can use someone else's code. You can figure out how it works and then be a better programmer as a result. Out in the real world, you don't really get this chance a whole lot. This would be wasting money and wasting time. And you don't want to do that when you actually have a budget and deadlines and all that kind of stuff coming up. Uh, now's a good time to get this out of your system. Uh, there are some reasons why everything I'm going over you should probably just ignore. Uh, a lot of this goes back into the real world reasons why you probably do not want to write your own math library, and you should only do this in student cases. Uh, one is bugginess. Your math library is almost certainly going to have bugs that a well-tested commercial grade math library does not have. Uh, that's just a fact of any new code. Uh, we'll go over some techniques later on on how to uh, reduce the amount of bugs in your code. Another thing is speed. Uh, again, your math library is probably not going to be as optimized as, say, DirectX Math. Probably. Uh, features. So there are other libraries out there that have every single possible feature you could ever imagine. Uh, you will never possibly implement all of these. So you know, it, it's really kind of handy to just use an existing math library in those cases. And again, not invented hair syndrome. This is actually a bad thing in the real world. Um, I still recommend as a student you do this anyway. Most of the cons I, I feel are outweighed by the pros, especially if you're just learning. Even out in the real world, there are certain cases where if you're writing your own engine from scratch or, or doing a lot of from scratch work, having your own library that you understand well, that has the exact features you need, the exact performance that you need, uh, is going to help you out quite a bit. All right, so there's quite a, bit, uh, quite a few different features we can put in our math library. Uh, the big one, obviously, is a vector. Uh, these are four component, two component, three component vectors, all this, this the standard linear algebra types. Uh, although in graphics and physics, we're generally dealing with 3D space, so we don't need vectors of, say, 17 components. Your math library needs to support two to four components per vector. Uh, vectors are generally going to be dealing with floats. Uh, floats are the 32-bit single, uh, single precision floating point number you guys are most use uh, used to. 
Uh, it's important to note that you will not generally use doubles. Uh, doubles are more precise. You have a lot of people saying, oh, just use a double. It solves all kind of problems. Unfortunately, doubles are a little bit slower for this processor to deal with. It takes more work. They, they're the native uh, SSE and SIMD instructions on your CPU don't really deal with four doubles very well. GPUs don't deal with four doubles very well. We stick to floats. There are some cases where you might want to have a vector or even a matrix of ints, or even in some cases, booleans. Uh, there's, there's some neat tricks you can do with those, but they're pretty rare. You're going to almost always be dealing with floats. Uh, the other thing you're going to want are matrices. These are going to be used for your standard 3D transformations, even 2D transformations, uh, you know, Math 140 and 250 here, and then CS200 and 250, I think, go into quite a bit of detail on how you use these to actually get stuff on your screen. Uh, in general, a, a matrix is, you, you think of a matrix as a vector of vectors. It's pretty handy. So for example, a 4x4 four four matrix, you can just think of four four-component vectors. Uh, and since they are just made out of vectors, I mean, their floats are the exact same characteristics that vectors have. Uh, so another useful feature is a quaternion, and we'll go into that in a tiny bit of detail later on in the talk. I know quaternions are scary. There's that meme that nobody understands how they work. Probably true. Uh, but actually using a quaternion in your code is actually very easy. Uh, just, you, know, you can get online, figure out how it works, get the code implemented, tested, and use them to do some really cool stuff. All right, so there's then the basic operations your math library needs to support. Do you have a question? We will later on in the talk. All right. Uh, so uh, some basic operations for your vector operations. You've got your component-wise vector addition, multiplication, division. You're going to want to be able to scale a vector, normalize a vector, get the magnitude of a vector, all of your standard linear algebra kind of operations. Uh, so with matrices, same things. You're going to take the transpose, take the inverse. Uh, there's a lot of uh, others, other rare operations that you may or may not have a need for. Uh, they're useful to just be aware of. All right, so then there's your general graphics functions. You want to have a function to generate a camera matrix. You want to have a function to generate your 3D perspective uh, projection matrix, your orthographic matrix. Uh, these are really easy functions to write. If, again, if you don't know the math off the top of your head, there are plenty of references online, classes here at DigiPen. Uh, not a whole lot to it, but you will want these helper functions. Uh, one good one to have is the ability to decompose a transform matrix. So if you have a 4x4 matrix, this is a function that can pull out the translation, rotation, and scale for certain varieties of uh, transform matrices. They come in handy in certain uh, graphics and uh, physics tricks. Uh, you're also going to want possibly a geometric library. This is especially true if you are doing any high-end graphics or particularly physics. Uh, so a geometric library is going to have things like points and lines and triangles and planes and routines for figuring out if they're intersecting, how close they are, the closest points. Uh, different trees you can use for setting up your objects in your scene for optimization purposes. Uh, we have an entire class here at DigiPen over this whole topic all on its own at CS350. So if you guys haven't taken it yet, you will soon. Uh, and then lastly, there are some more advanced operations. These come up pretty rarely. Um, in most student games, you'll probably not need any of these. But if you're doing something really fancy, you might run into the need to have uh, a couple of these here or there. I, if you run into something you need and your math library doesn't have it, essentially just add it. Don't worry, don't worry about it too much. So I, I've stressed before about going for the simplest route possible, not writing things you don't need, not spending time on things that aren't actually helping your game improve. Uh, so the idea is to, if you just want to write a custom math library, what is the absolute minimum amount you need in order to have a useful bit of code? I think the obvious one is that you need a three-component vector. You're going to be working with 3D math. You need an X, Y, and Z. If you're working with 2D, then you can actually just get away with a two-component vector. Uh, you actually, in 3D, don't necessarily need a four-component vector. If you're not doing a lot of matrix math on your CPU, you're letting the GPU do all of it, you can actually get away without having a four-component vector or three-component in the 2D case. Uh, same thing with matrices. You don't actually need to do any matrix math on the CPU. You can do it all on the GPU. You'll need a couple functions to generate the matrices for you. But even then, uh, instead of generating a matrix in a matrix class, it can just generate an array of flows that you feed to the graphics API, which is what they take natively anyway. Uh, quaternions, if you're not doing animation, you don't need them. There are other ways to deal with rotations. And the geometric library is only needed for certain algorithms that for simpler games, you definitely just don't need. Uh, yeah, so the most important functions uh, you're going to need are the projection matrix for your 3D library and your basic vector operations for your three-component vector. It's about it. 
Uh, that said, you're going to need more than that. You, if you're building a really simple game, if you're doing a game jam, maybe you could get by with that. If you are writing an actual game you're going to be turning in at the end of next semester, you're going to need tons more math support. You're going to be using matrices and all different kinds of vectors and all different kinds of support functions. Uh, but uh, keeping in mind that bare minimum, that's a good place to start. If you're not sure where, not sure where to start in a math library, get your basic vector in. Get the, the absolute minimum you need to get something drawing on screen. And then you can add f uh, features as you have the need for them, rather than sitting here up front trying to think, what are all the possible different math types I'm going to need? What are all the different functions I'm going to need? I don't know. If you don't need them, you don't need to worry about writing them. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah, so I mean, utilize your time well. You don't need it all. Write what you need. All right, so if you're writing a math library, uh, as a library author, one of your biggest jobs is actually designing the API, uh, the interface that the rest of the people on your team are going to be using to interact with your math library. And there's a lot of tricks to this. This is, this is an art form. We could go on for years teaching how to do this. At, at some point, there's just good taste. It's something that some people are particularly good at. Some people struggle with a little bit. Uh, but there are some tips you can use to kind of help out for the people who are struggling and maybe guide the people who will eventually be API design masters. Uh, down the right road. Uh, so one of the th there's a few goals I like to approach whenever I'm writing an API, uh, and these are actually in order of preference for the most part. Um, you want to write it. You want to make it easy to use. Uh, you want to make it easy to discover. Uh, so what discoverability means is, let's say you as a programmer sitting down, you've never used this library before. Where are all its features? Uh, so this, this is usually the, the learning curve, we would say, of the library. It's important to make sure that the library is easy to use or easy to learn. But you're, you want to optimize more for the people who are using it day in and day out. These are people who've already learned it and how they're going to keep using it. So if you've got this idea like, I want to make all of my functions have these really, really long, very descriptive names, it makes it really easy to tell what's going on the first time you use it, it makes it a complete pain in the butt to use it every time thereafter. So it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, you want to make the API difficult to use incorrectly. And there's actually a lot of cases where you have a I'm sure you've all used a function somewhere where you, you thought you were using it right, you looked at the docs, you looked at the parameters it takes, you used it, and it didn't work the way you thought it did. Uh, or you know, it just completely blows up. This is a function that is easy to use incorrectly. If it is a function you sit down, it's got this list of parameters, it says it does this, you should, you should be able to figure out what it's going to do. The first time you use it, it's just going to work. Uh, so you want to kind of design around that. And lastly, you want to make it difficult to use inefficiently. And this is, this is really important for things like a math library. Uh, if, if your default, if, if you have like two versions of a function that do the same thing, but one does it in an inefficient way and one does it in, in the efficient way, make the efficient way one easier to use or possibly the only version you have. Uh, there's actually cases where you, you'll probably have both versions. We'll go into that a bit, bit later. But certainly optimize for being optimized. It's just going to save everyone a lot of time going down the road. Uh, down the road. They're not going to mistakenly use the uh, unoptimal version. Uh, yeah, so when there's, in cases where there are two ways to do it, uh, you want to make sure that you are optimizing for the common case. Right? Uh, so if you've, again, if you've got these two functions where, uh, you know, let's say for example you have your, your camera generation, your, your camera matrix generation functions, and you have right-handed version and left-handed version, and you know you're writing everything in OpenGL, you should probably just make it easier to use the right-handed version, left-handed version. Not, you know, maybe have one just be the nice short version of the function name, the other one be the long left-handed DirectX only version of the function name. Uh, kind of a bad example, but it's kind of kind of getting on the, the gist of what we're doing there. If you don't need both, only write one. Uh, there's this completeness thing. I, when I write math libraries, I like to be complete, generate all the different things I could possibly need. As I said before, it's a bad idea. If you know you're writing an OpenGL app, only write the, the version for OpenGL. If you know you're writing a DirectX app, only write the version for DirectX. You don't need both, unless you decide to port later on. Uh, so there, is a lot of, there, there, there are a lot of pitfalls in writing a math library, a lot of things that are kind of not obvious at first. We're going to go into a lot of these here. Uh, so the SIMD optimized libraries that don't actually work well with SIMD. We're going to go into what SIMD means in a bit here. but. A lot of people hear about SSE and they want to use these intrinsics and they write this code and it actually is worse than if they hadn't used the intrinsics at all. That is certainly, certainly a big one I see a lot. Uh, the usability issue is also just kind of hard. There's a lot of different ways to do things. There's a lot of this is just kind of taste. Um, and then lastly, testing. If you have a math library and you haven't tested it properly, you are hurting everyone else on your team. Uh, so in, in, uh, in the API design category, we're going over a bit about how to name your functions and name your types. So naming can actually be really hard in API design. 
Uh, I've actually worked at a job before where we've had three meetings on how to name some tables in a SQL database. We felt this was really important. These are things that we're going to be stuck with for a long time. Uh, it goes back to discoverability and ease of use. If, if you see something and it's got a confusing name, it, it's just harder to learn. It's harder to remember what it does. Uh, it, it just makes you feel better. If you look at your code and you, you like the names, you're going to be happier about it. There, there's a lot of psychological aspects going on there. But as a quick example, uh, the four component vector you have in your math library. Should we name it float4 like HLSL does? Should we name it vec4 like GLSL does? Should we name it something completely non-ambiguous like F32V4? Should we name it something else, maybe a longer name that's, you know, kind of totally spells out what the F and V mean in this case? Uh, it's really a matter of taste. There is no correct answer here. As long as it's not utterly confusing and just bogus, any one of these work just fine. Uh, yeah, it's not, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, do be consistent. That is the big thing. If, if you are going to use float4 uh, you know, for, for your four component vector, then don't decide to name your three component vector float v3 or something. You know, pick something, stick with it. Uh, I personally, for the consistency reason, don't like using the float4, uh, the, the direct 3D kind of naming. Because we use things like int32 in our code to mean a 32-bit integer. So if I see float 4, that to me just automatically makes me think that's supposed to be a 4-bit floating point number, which doesn't make any sense at all. Or what happens if we then want to have a 4-component integer uh, vector? Is that int 4? Does that mean a 4-bit integer? Or it, it is, to me, inconsistent. And there's, there's ways to resolve that. They're, they're not good names. I prefer going more of the, uh, the GLSL route. Vec 4, to me at least, is clear. Uh, it's one of those things where it's not necessarily discoverable. Vec what? What does that mean? Once you understand it, you just memorize it and you remember it for the rest of your life. It's not difficult. Uh, OpenGL uses a, a prefix letter to the name, so an integer vector would be IVEC 3 or 2 or 4. Yeah, there, there's options here. Um, just pick whichever you like, be consistent, kind of the main message. Uh, another thing is to use nouns and verbs and all that kind of stuff consistently. So a lot of people have uh, method names are usually verbs. The method says do this to the object. But in other cases, people then use a noun, like transform.matrix, to get the matrix. Well, that's, that's, that's not a verb. So now it's, it's a little confusing. It's not consistent with the APIs you designed so far. However, with math libraries, because we use these operations all the time, having these really long names is just kind of annoying. Uh, so yeah, we get a v1 dot. It's very obvious what this does. It's not a verb. We know what it does. If we had compute dot product, that'd just be a pain. No one wants to see that. Even if, even if you're using autocomplete to write it for you, every line of code you have does math is going to be this long. It's going to be atrocious. Try to stick towards verbs for, na for uh, methods, nouns for types, but you can bend the rule when good taste dictates it's okay. And again, that goes back to taste, personal, personal matter, more of an art form. Uh, so in math libraries, there's a couple different ways to approach writing your operations. You've got your vector and you want to write a dot product, but where exactly do you put the dot product operation? Uh, you could either make it a free function or a method on the object itself, whereas a free function means it's not a method in a class. It's just a global function, essentially. Uh, in, in the C++ community, uh, from the, the people who've actually, you know, write and design C++, write the, the main books, uh, there's a saying that if an operation can be written using an object's public interface, make it a free function. So essentially what that means is, let's say you have your vec4 and you have these public x, y, z, w uh, components on your vector4. Uh, you don't necessarily need to put your dot product as a method on that vector because any function could just read those values and compute the dot product. Uh, so yeah, there's no reason for that to be a method. It doesn't need some internal access to the, the vector. It doesn't need to be a part of it in order to function. However, Code completion is this awesome thing we have, and it works a lot better when you're writing things as methods. If you have a free function and you've got this vec4 variable sitting there, you can you know, mouse over the vec4 and get a list of all the methods on it. Or you're typing out v whatever dot, and it just drops down the list of all the methods. With the free functions, you lose that. Uh, so you lose some of the discoverability. You lose that ability to just kind of automatically have the compiler pull up all those available optimization, or yeah, all those available methods for you. Uh, so there, there's this trade-off where old wisdom says we should always use free functions when possible. Newer wisdom that's kind of based around the tools we actually use is saying we should make it a method whenever it's not horrible to make it a method. Uh, and there, there's a few ways around the, the problem with free functions. Question? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. Uh, so the the comment was that you could use a namespace, uh, so you can still get the drop down. So you could put all of your vectors in the math namespace, uh, which I do believe I have had a slide for. Yes. Yeah, so you can do that. The the problem that I argue not to do that is that that now loses the mouse over capability. Um, it's this little little tiny bit of a difference in usability. Again, matter of taste. If you prefer the free functions or you prefer using the namespace, there is absolutely no reason not to do it that way. I will not argue against it to any great uh, length. I prefer them as methods at this point. Um, all right, so there's a little bit of mystery here. This code will compile. Uh, so you bring up namespaces. Uh, we have in here this class called bar in namespace foo. We have a function called do stuff that takes a bar. Down here we have a variable of type foo bar, and we call do stuff, but we don't put the method or the namespace in front of do stuff. And this will compile without having a using namespace. So this is an interesting fact that will actually help if you want to use namespaces for your uh, for your math library. The reason this works is something called argument dependent lookup. This is a feature of C that they added. Uh, essentially to help with operator overloading. But essentially the way it works is if you call a method or an operator on a type, and that method, or, or I'm sorry, not a method, a free function or a operator on a type, and there's no definition for that function or that operator, C++ will then look at the namespaces of the types of the parameters passed into it and search those for those types. So in this code sample here, we say we're calling do stuff on, on goes, and uh, there is no definition of do stuff in the global namespace. Well, we see that this variable is defined of a type that is in namespace foo. So now the compiler is going to search the namespace foo and find this definition of do stuff. Uh, so this is actually kind of a handy trick that you can use for your math library. Uh, so I said it was originally done for operator overloading because it'd be a real pain if you had this namespaced math type, like say a vec4, where you wanted to override the plus operator and you put that in your namespace, but now even though you're, you, you can't actually call the operator without doing a using namespace or actually putting a namespace in front of the operator, which is just horrible syntax, uh, total pain. So it's originally added for this, but it, it actually comes in handy for any other kind of function. Uh, so an example of what you can do using ADL, uh, let's say we want to write this generic templated function called closest to zero. Right? Uh, and it takes two values and returns whichever one is closer to zero. So we take the absolute value of those and then take the minimum. Uh, this code works just fine for floats, for instance, or integers. Uh, however, there's a problem. Our vector, the standard absolute value here, this is not overridden for any of our custom math types. Uh, same goes for this, the standard min function. Uh, yeah, so we can't use it for our custom vec, and we could add a custom game math, if our name source is game math, absolute value function, but it's not going to work. Uh, so you can see here is this example where we're trying to use the VEC4. It's just not going to be happy no matter what. Um, however, if we now make use of ADL, so now whenever we use these functions, we're not going to specify the, the namespace explicit we're, explicitly. We're going to let the compiler find it for us. Uh, so in that case, uh, yeah, it'll go ahead and find the VEC4 ABS version. Uh, for floats, however, there's now another problem. Uh, floats are not, do not have a namespace. All the built-in types are in no namespace, but the absolute value function is in the standard namespace. This is kind of a bummer with ADL. It's a little bit of a pain. You have to put in the using standard whatever that you're trying to use to make sure that it will find those default uh, built-in versions for you while still using, while not explicitly specifying the namespace when you call the function so it will find the versions for your custom types in the ADL. Uh, there's it's a little confusing how it can work sometimes. There's certain cases where you might think it should work and it doesn't work, and other cases where you think it shouldn't work and it does work. But the gist of it is, if you call a function, it will look at the type, it will look in the namespaces of the types of the parameters you've actually passed in. Uh, use it a few times, write a couple of these functions. It should come out fairly clearly, and if not, by all means, just track me down and I can explain it in a little bit more detail. Uh, so yeah, so you can, you can use this to write generic versions of functions like clamp and lerp, uh, linear interpolation. They're going to work with floats and vectors and matrices, uh, even if they're in different namespaces and defined all over the place. Uh, so even if you prefer methods for code completion purposes, you might actually consider writing, especially functions like these, like clamp, uh, writing a free function version of it so you can plug them into generic algorithms like the function closest to, z uh, closest to zero. Uh, so there's actually a good a good argument to actually have both methods and free functions in certain cases. 
Uh, another option is use a static method. Uh, so I, there's actually quite a few math libraries that do these. So if you have a type vec4, then instead of having uh, the dot product be a, a method on the object or be a free function, it might be a static method. So you've got to type in vec4 colon colon uh, as compared to, say, vec3 colon colon for that dot product. Again, totally a matter of taste. It really doesn't matter a whole lot which one you use. Just be consistent. Uh, so personally, I mean, I've written math libraries using all three of these different methods, combinations thereof. I have my taste. I think my taste is, is better fit for me, obviously. But you guys use whatever you think works best. All right, so the meat, uh, the, 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 meat the bread and butter of uh, the math library is going to be your vector classes, which you're going to be using all the time. Uh, I, I, I'm fairly certain in games we use vectors more often than we use scalar floats. I really wouldn't be surprised if someone did stats and we found out that, found out that was the case. Uh, so there's a lot of different approaches on how to build a good vector class for a math library, especially in C++. C++ gives you a lot of different tools, a lot of different ways to accomplish the same task. Uh, so for example, we could use a bunch of different classes. We could have a specific class for four for component vectors, a specific class for three component vectors, another class for three component integer vectors, so on and so forth. We can use the powerful feature of C++ uh, templates and have it generate all these different versions for us. We write one generic definition of a vector or a matrix, and it does all the hard work. Uh, we can use the hybrid approach, where we mix templates and specific classes. Uh, so I'm going to go over how to do it the templated way, because that is that's the way a lot of uh, C++ programmers kind of want to do it at first. And it, it just seems really obvious that this is the good way to do it. All right. So the idea here is that we can write a type like vector, and we can template it both on the actual type of value it contains and how many components it has. Uh, so, and for anyone who hasn't seen syntax like this before at the end there, you can actually pass in non-type template parameters. So you can have an int. So in this case, uh, you'd actually hard code whether this is the size is three or two or, or so on and so forth. Uh, so here we create a vector, and we tell it it's going to be of a type and size, for example, float and size three. And then we go ahead and we can create an array of size three of floats. And we can put operators in there. Uh, in this case, we just have a single dot, because that's all that fits on one slide. Uh, so at that point, then, we can go ahead and write uh, generic versions of these op operations themselves. For almost all vector and matrix operations we do, we can actually write it as a loop. Uh, the dot product, we loop over the two the, the components on both values, multiply them together, sum them up, return that scalar value. Uh, you can do this for um, you know, matrix determinants. You can do it for cross products. You can do it for matrix multiplication. You can do it in all different kinds of circumstances. There's very, very few places you can't directly do this. Uh, so we can do the same thing with the matrix. Uh, here, you know, it's a type. Instead of just having the number of components, we now have the number of rows and columns. Or I prefer to use major and minor. Because uh, if you're writing a GL, or, if you're writing your code to be GL oriented, then you're probably going to have your columns be major. If you're writing a direct 3D oriented, you probably have your rows be major. So I, I abstract away the rows and columns a bit here. But yeah, this looks almost exactly like the vector case, just different operations, but same general approach. Uh, so there are problems with the template approach, and while it seems like it might, at first look, it might seem obvious that template's the right way to go, I'm actually going to argue that they're a horrible way to go for a math library. Uh, so the first problem is that the opera some operations are not generic. Take the cross product, for instance. Cross product is not defined for two component or four component uh, vectors. It's for three components. Mostly there's actually some other vector sizes where cross product is well defined. We don't use those in games. I really don't care about them. You probably don't either. Uh, matrix inversion. You can't normally invert a non-square matrix. There's like different kinds of ways you can do inversion, but the standard matrix invert inverse is only really defined for a square matrix. So if you try to write a single template that can support any arbitrary size of matrix, you're going to have trouble writing an invert function that's even going to compile or have any real proper return value. Same goes for a cross product. It's really difficult to write a cross product that actually does anything meaningful in a generic way. Uh, the templates restrict your API design in a lot of cases. Uh, so for example, if you want to have a constructor for your VEC4 where you just give it four floats, if you're using a template, you can't have a templated function that takes a variable number of arguments like that. You can almost kind of do it in C++11, but not really. Uh, so you're stuck. You can't actually have this overridden constructor. You might think you can derive your class from the vec, you know, have a derived vec4 that uh, derives from your vec, uh, your templated vector of size four and type float. 
uh, but there's actually a lot of other problems that happens with that. It, it doesn't work out too well. The same goes for your accessors. You might want to have it so your VEC3 has a .x, .y, .z. For your generic uh, vector type, you can't actually add that. You can't add the .y and actually have this code work in, in any way for a two-component vector. You, you have to hard-code these for particular sizes. There's ways you can do this. Uh, if you look at my blog, I actually experimented with a bit and found ways to solve this problem. But the code is ugly. It's messy. It's not something you should have to deal with. It's just it's bad. Don't do it. Uh, there's optimization issues. Uh, so when we get into the SSE stuff a little bit uh, later on here, it, you can't generically write SSE code. SSE, the SIMD stuff, requires a four-component float. So if you have a four-component float vector uh, for the general case. So if you want to write this nice optimized SSE library, it's only going to work for one particular type, and you can't make it generic for a five-component vector or a three-component vector. Uh, so you're, you can't use this templated code in this case. Uh, and lastly, templates bloat compile times. I, I think a lot of you know that already. And if not, you do now. The more templates you have, slower things compile. So avoid them unless you need them. All right. So. There are some other things you might think you can do. Template specializations come to mind pretty immediately. You might want to decide that you want to support arbitrarily sized vectors, because maybe physics is going to need a 17 float vector for some weird algorithm he's doing internally in his code. But you want to make sure you have that nice optimized SSE version of your VEC4 that has the dot .x and dot .y and dot .z and W. Uh, so you're just going to specialize your template and then have that, that whole rewritten version of it just for your four-component four floating point vector. You can certainly do that, um, but at that point, you now have essentially gone to the hybrid approach. You are rewriting this class from scratch because of the way vectors, the, the template specialization works. And you're still dealing with the bloated compile times. And you, you really don't need a 17 float vector. You, you just, you don't. I wouldn't worry about that. I, the generic types are useful for a lot of high end math, scientific computing, which is why you look at these libraries online, they support all this. In games, we don't need them. I wouldn't worry about supporting them. Yeah, don't worry about it. All right, so another approach is to have a specific type. All right, so we are going to make a whole different class for VEC4 versus VEC3 versus 3 by 3 matrix. And yeah, this requires rewriting or cut and pasting a lot of code. Your code for your VEC4 is a totally separate header file and separate CPP file from your code for your VEC3. Uh, and you know, we, we train ourselves not to do this. Copying, copying and pasting code is bad. Right? It, it's, it, it makes the code, uh, bugs will, will get copied around. You'll fix the bug in one version of it, but then not remember to fix it in the other three versions you copied from it. Uh, it's just, it's a lot of, there's a lot of waste, there's a lot of maintenance overhead. We really, really train ourselves not to ever copy and paste code and reuse as much as possible. Um, however, these types are slightly different. Again, the VEC3 has a cross product. The VEC4 doesn't. Uh, there, there's various cases, uh, especially if you're doing methods, I mean, it just starts falling apart. And it's really not that much code that you're going to be co you know, copying and pasting. These types are not super complex. Even if you have a complete math library for a 3D game, it, it, it's really little, very, very little code. It takes very little time to, to set this up. My recommendation, if you go this approach, is to write the two most complicated types first, your VEC4 and your 4x4 matrix. Uh, these are going to have you know, the, the most amount of members inside of them. They're the math the, the, the kernels of the math functions on them are going to have the most amount of work to do. You can write those, and then you can just copy and paste those and trim them down. So when you copy and paste your VEC4 to your VEC3, you just chop off the W component and then comp keep compiling until the errors go away, essentially. It sounds horrible, but it takes five minutes, and you've got your VEC3, and you're done. Well, except for VEC3, you've got to write the cross product. But in general, it holds true. All right, so a couple different approaches. You can also do the hybrid approach. Uh, again, you might have your specific VEC4 type as well as the, the templated type. You might have your free functions versus your methods. The free functions actually get around some of those template problems. Uh, for a free function, you can just have a global function that is your cross product that only takes templates of size three and actually works around one of those limitations of the templated types. But yeah, I, I, I recommend going the, the distinct types. It, it's just easier in the long run. All right, so SIMD intrinsics. This is something a lot of people ask about. It's something a lot of people are confused about. Uh, it's not necessarily taught as often or as well as it should be, and that's going to include this lecture. <laughs> uh, we're going to go over just some of the bits of how they work and things you should be aware of. So what SIMD means, it is single instruction, multiple data. Uh, your standard CPU, you have the multiply instruction. It takes two floating point numbers or two integers and multiplies them. One instruction, one set of data. Uh, what the SIMD stuff does is you can say, I want you to multiply something, but it's going to multiply four things at once instead of just one thing. 
Uh, and so this is actually really useful, obviously, for four component vectors. And it just makes things more efficient. If you can do four things with one instruction, it's a lot better than doing one thing with one instruction. Uh, so there's actually a lot of different uh, brand names for SIMD, essentially, the different instruction sets on different CPUs. If you're using the Intel compatible CPU standard in our desktop computers, uh, you're going to be looking at SSE, which stands for the Streaming SIMD Extensions. Uh, if you're ever writing for an ARM CPU, which is going to be iPhone, Android, uh, the new Windows 8 RT, uh, things like that, uh, those all use an instruction set called NEON for SIMD. And then if you're writing on PowerPC systems, which are consoles and quite a few supercomputers, uh, they're going to be using what's called Ultavec. But essentially, they're the same general concepts, just the different programming API. Uh, so an example of what you can do here, um, SIMD instructions allow multiple pieces of data to be processed at once. So you see here we've got four non-SIMD instructions. I have to do four multiplies to do all this work in pseudo assembly code. With SIMD, I do one instruction, way quicker. Very, very obvious how much quicker that's going to be. Uh, so the, the actual uh, C++ language has no native support for SIMD types. There is no built-in vector four. There is no built-in matrix. If there was, this talk would not be happening right now. Uh, you got to write these on your, on, on your own, and you have to access these native uh, CPU instructions on your own. Uh, however, you do not use inline assembly. A lot of people keep talking about, oh, you got to use assembly in games to make things go fast. Do not do that. Uh, writing assembly, inline assembly in your code actually forces the compiler to disable all of its optimizations, because it doesn't know what your assembly is doing. It can't look at your assembly and figure out which registers it's screwing up or what other weird things you're doing. It just has to assume that you're following the rules about how functions are supposed to work, and it has to disable all of the fancy optimizations so that it also follows that rules and your code can play together. Do not use inline assembly unless you are absolutely 100% certain you have to. So for SIMD stuff, we have what are called intrinsics. These are functions that the compiler has built in that kind of uh, wrap the, the SSE uh, uh, it, CPU instructions. But they're in ways that the compiler understands what they do. It, it knows what's going on, and it can optimize around them and optimize them itself. And again, there's different intrinsics for each of the different SIMD CPU instruction sets. So we're going to go over SSE because that's what most of you are going to be using in your student projects most likely. Uh, so there's a couple different headers. Uh, the SSE headers from Intel are essentially all mmintrin.h. The original ones were for MMX for the multimedia extensions. Uh, we don't use those anymore because those don't really help us a whole lot for games. They just tack on a new letter for each one. SSE2 is P, yeah. SSE3 is sort of an E. They've used like almost every other letter by this point. It's a really weird naming scheme. I don't know what those are supposed to mean, but that's what we do. Uh, so you can get online, you can search up all the ones. If you want to use SSE 4 or 4.1, you can find the headers. Not a big deal. Um, I would recommend you stick with SSE 2 or SSE 3 for now. SSE 4 adds several very, very awesome instructions that, for speed reasons, we would love to have. Uh, but if you look at the Steam hardware survey, for instance, most users don't have it yet. Or enough users don't have it yet that if you were to make your game and you used SSE 4 intrinsics, it would just crash in your computer because your CPUs aren't new enough. Uh, everybody has SSE2. You can use that completely safely. Um, actually, if you compile in 64-bit mode, 64-bit Intel compatible CPUs are required to support SSE2. Uh, so you actually don't even see the old x87 floating point show up much. Uh, SSE3, the last time I looked at the Steam hardware survey, it's 98.7%. It's enough you can use it and not worry about it. Uh, SSE4, though, you got to avoid for now. Uh, so there are some reference pages online. Uh, the first one would be the Intel Intrinsics Guide. You can easily just Google this. They have three different versions for different operating systems. They're, the API is more or less the same. It's the, the platform-specific stuff is integration kind of stuff. Uh, the Microsoft document, or the MSDN reference for these are also quite fine. Uh, I, I usually use those more often than anything else simply because MSDN shows up more often when I search for things on Google. Uh, kind of funny. Uh, the SSE Plus library is another reference that I see pop up a lot. Um, I don't actually recommend using the library, but their reference is actually very, it's, it's very compact, very easy to browse through. It just lists out all the different instructions, what arguments they take, what the names of the intrinsics are, uh, which is something, it's really hard to remember. They get really, really awkward, goofy names. It's difficult to keep them in your head. Um, so a couple things about what these registers are and what they do. Uh, so the SSE registers are 128-bit data types. If you think of them as four floats, and a float is 32, di uh, 32 bits, they're going to be 128 bits. Uh, they are primarily used for 32-bit floats, although they actually do have instructions for using two 64-bit uh, doubles, or using four 32-bit ints, or even eight 16-bit ints. Uh, they actually support quite a few different variations of all these. 
so all of the intrinsic functions are going to start with an underscore, underscore, mm. This is just, again, the legacy from the mmx functions. Uh, interestingly enough, the documentation always lists them with a single underscore, but the actual functions when you use them are double underscore. I'm not sure what that's about, but it's just something to keep in mind. If you're searching on Google, it might seem a little weird. Um, so the intrinsics you're going to be using most in a game will end with underscore ps. And what this acronym means is that it is a packed single. Packed meaning that there's as many of them fit in 128 bits. Single meaning a single precision float. PS means four 32-bit floats. If you see uh, PD, that's going to mean packed double. That will mean two 64-bit doubles. And there's, th there's other suffix, uh, suffixes for the integers, things like that. Uh, so non-vector math, especially, again, if you're on 64-bit mode or you just enable the SSC optimizations in your compiler, which you should do, you're going to see them end with underscore SS. The reason for this is that the SSE instructions have replaced the old Intel x87 uh, floating point operations that I think you guys are still learning in an assembly class. Uh, we don't use those anymore for the most part. Uh, so we use the SSC things, but we use underscore SS, which means a scalar single precision. So it's storing a, single, it's storing a float in just the first 32 bits of the... Uh, the SSC register, uh, and it, it just does the scalar operations on it. All right. So dot product. When you're looking at uh, the intrinsics, they're all pretty straightforward. You can multiply two vectors together, all that kind of add them, all that kind of stuff. And everyone kind of looks at the SSC intrinsics and says, hey, where's the dot product at? How, how do you do a dot product? That seems really, really important. We use those a lot. Uh, the problem is that the dot product is naturally against what SSC and SIMD stand for. SIMD is all about if you have you have multiple pieces of data that you're doing in parallel. You can't actually do a dot product in parallel. If you think about it, you can't, uh, the whole idea is you could say multiply four, four floats in a row. With a dot product, you have four floats, you multiply two of them by, two of them against each other at the same time. So you're not doing four things, you're only doing two. You then take that result and multiply those by each other. So now you're just doing one thing instead of four. Now you add them all up, so you're only doing three things. The entire operation is just, go, it, it goes against how a, uh, the, the SIMD CPU works. When you're doing it the way we usually do it in games, there's other ways to do it that actually make it work. We don't use this much. Uh, SSE4 has a dot product instruction uh, called, interesting enough, DPPS for dot product packed single. Uh, again, we can't actually use SSE4 for compatibility reasons yet. Uh, there is an instruction called an SSE3 called HADPS. When you are writing your custom dot product in your SSC intrinsics, you're going to have to use that one. A lot of guides online don't go over it, which is why I just want to make sure you guys are aware of it. A lot of the guides are still written for SSC 1 or 2. Uh, you need the H add PS, or you don't need it, but it, it helps makes it, help makes it faster, essentially. Uh, so we're talking about how the dot product, you do those multiplies and you add all the results together. H add makes it a lot quicker to do those adds. Uh, it stands for horizontal add. So if you think of normally the SSE instructions, you've got multiple rows of vectors. You've got one vector and then a second vector, and you're multiplying the two rows together. Uh, eight, the horizontal means you've got a single row of, of uh, values, and you're just multiplying them together horizontally. It's weird nomenclature, but that's what we got. Uh, you can't rely on them on having SSE 4. You can rely on them on SSE 3. That's slightly wrong there. But yeah, for the dot product, you're just going to have to suck it up and deal with the fact that your dot product SSE function will probably be one of the ugliest functions you write for your, your intrinsic library. It's silly, but that's just the reality. Uh, so there's a lot of information on how to optimize for SSE correctly. Uh, when you guys get the slide online later, this link goes over it. You can just search for optimizing SSE. There are tons of great guides, uh, especially if you see any ones that mention SSE 3. They're going to be fairly up to date and useful. Uh, there's a couple things like instruction pairing and data dependencies. That is a huge topic in and of itself. Uh, class here at DigiPen, CS391 goes into that in quite a bit of detail along with other topics. Uh, if I haven't mentioned already, if you are not planning on taking CS391, plan to take CS391. It is one of the best classes at the school by far. Uh, so instruction pairing, data dependencies is essentially the way you write your math code. Uh, we can go into that in quite a bit of detail. If you're interested in optimizing math code, just come talk to me. And I can talk your ear off about it for a while. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is the compiler can do a pretty decent job of uh, do a pretty decent job for you. There's a lot of uh, old wisdom floating around that you can't trust the compiler. You've got to write all this assembly code by hands. The compiler is a horrible job. That's not super true these days. Uh, I would say you can uh, you shouldn't trust the compiler, but you shouldn't doubt it either. If you're concerned about the speed of something. Just test the code or take a look at the assembly output, but don't immediately assume it's going to be wrong and try to do it for it. Uh, you know, let the compiler do its job and only fix it if the compiler is actually screwing up. 
so SSE has a couple things that just makes it really hard to use. One of those is the alignment issue with SSE. All right, so SSE values, in order to efficiently load a value out of memory into an SSE register, it has to be aligned, uh, aligned to a 128-bit boundary. So essentially what that means is you have your pointer address in memory. Uh, you need to be able to evenly divide it by 128 bits, uh, so 16 bytes. Uh, if it does not evenly divide by that number, it is not aligned. Uh, this is actually true for all types. Integers, for instance, have to be 4-byte aligned. Doubles have to be 8-byte aligned. Uh, some CPUs will actually allow you to load those into registers, but it actually slows it down considerably. Uh, it has to do more work to kind of correct the fact that it's trying to read out of certain segments of memory, or segments, certain addresses of memory aligned properly, and it, it just has to work around it. So you, with SSE, however, there, it's actually a lot more noticeable. There's actually totally different instructions for doing an unaligned load versus an aligned load, even on Intel CPUs. Uh, so if you're trying to use the aligned version, which is super fast, you have to allocate your memory that your vectors are in uh, to make sure this actually works. Uh, the problem is that on most platforms, when you allocate memory, it only guarantees an 8-byte alignment. And it does that because doubles need an 8-byte alignment, and doubles are built into C++ and wants to make sure that you can allocate a double and it always works. SSE types are not built into C++, so they don't guarantee that you can allocate them. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, so I, this is, I, I think personally this is the hardest part of using SSE is the fact that you can't just start writing the code and slapping some SSE vectors in your objects because as soon as you allocate them with new, you're going to start crashing. Uh, it's, it's really unfortunate. There are some, some workarounds we can do though. Uh, one of them is to uh, just actually write your own alignment functions. Uh, for the compiler to do it for it, internally for stack allocated objects when you make a vec4 as a local variable, you have to tell it that you want it to be aligned on the Microsoft compiler. You do it with this syntax. Uh, but when you're using new, delete, malloc, or free, you're just going to have to write your own versions of those. Uh, it's a good exercise. That's actually something we do a lot in the games industry. It's not super hard, but for a student game where you have other more important things to spend your time on, it's a real bummer. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot of ways around that if you are really dead set on directly storing your vector types in memory. Uh, however, there are a couple of things you can do. One option is to differentiate between your vector types that you store in an object versus the types you use locally. So what I mean by that is you have a class like transform. Transform has a vector 4 in it for you know, your position, for instance. Uh, that is a, you would make that a different class than the local variable you'd use to actually write math. And the reason there is that your local variables, when it's aligned, the compiler can automatically align local variables for you. The one in the storage version is not aligned. It just makes it, makes it possible to use new, delete, uh, like normal. You then use the slower unaligned load to load from storage into a local variable, but then your local variables can do, everything the fa can do everything the fast way. Or even if you're loading them into a special array that you allocated just for, say, your physics library, you can do the extra work just for that array to, al to align it properly. Uh, it just makes your code a little bit easier to write. Uh, yeah, the problem with this is that it's difficult to enforce. It's difficult. It's more. It's a lot of more extra work. Uh, a lot of errors happen. I see a lot of, uh, like a lot of professional engines actually go this route, but it's a huge pain in the butt. I don't recommend going this way unless you're really, really keen on squeezing out the last bit of performance. Um, the other option is to just use the unaligned load all the time. It is slower. If you look at the benchmarks, it is noticeably slower. It is, however, still more efficient than not using SSE at all. So if you're just looking for the easy route, you want to get a speed boost, but you don't want to spend tons of time uh, writing custom memory managers and all this extra work for your math library, this is a totally viable way to go, even in a shipping commercial game. I mean, most, most, most shipping commercial games these days do not do like really crazy 3D stuff. Right? The indie game scene is, is showing us that quite a bit. This works just fine. Uh, it's totally totally viable way to go. Uh, for a student game, I, I especially recommend you just use the unaligned loads. It's easier. Uh, for more advanced projects, especially if you're, say, game 300 or game 400, you're the tech director, you should probably be writing a custom memory manager anyway, at least once for the practice. Uh, just making sure your memory manager automatically aligns things to 16-byte boundaries would just solve the problem for you. Uh, so, I mean, it's, that, that is a way to go if you're one of the teams that are set up to do a custom memory manager. Uh, yeah, again, the solution two, which was the two different types, I, I've seen a lot of people say it's the best. I, I disagree. I don't think it's worth the effort. Um, so there's another term. When you guys are Googling SSE and actually looking at the intrinsics a bit later, you're going to run into these acronyms. Um, and they're actually really important to the way SSE is optimized. So there's AOS. AOS stands for an array of structures. 
Essentially what this means is that you have a single array of structures of four components. So for example, you have a list of all the positions of your game objects. This is an array of game object positions. The very first four entries are the x, y, z, w position of the first object. So the first object is green here, for instance. Then the next four are the x, y, z, w of the second object. Uh, pretty straightforward. It, it almost seems like that's the obvious way to do things in a lot of ways. Uh, the other way to do things is what's called a structure of arrays. So essentially what this means is that we have a separate array for each component. We have one array just for the x's and one away, array just for the y's and one array just for the z's. Uh, there might actually be one array, but even in that case, they're arranged like this. You've got, the x, you've got all the x's and all the y's and all the z's. Uh, this is a lot, this is not a necessarily a natural way to think about things, but when you're writing highly optimized SSE oriented, SIMD oriented code, this makes it possible to do much, much better optimizations. You can actually, you can process millions of entries like these much more efficiently than if you are using the other way. Things like dot product, we said that was a pain in the butt to do. Dot product is actually really easy to do when you're using this kind of layout for your, your vectors in memory. Uh, there's a problem is uh, even though it's totally fast, uh, the array of structures is just much easier to use. If you have, if you want to store all of the positions of your game objects, you just want to have a list of positions. And most likely you're not going to have just a list of positions, you're going to have a list of positions and your rotations and your scales. You want them all together, you're not going to want 15 different arrays to manage all these. Um, and most importantly, the GPU is really, it, it pretty much requires you to submit it in the array of structures format. As a game, we use the GPU more than we use the CPU in most cases. So trying to generate these data structures that are optimized for the CPU, but then you know, hurt us when we try to get things to the GPU is not really a good approach. If you are writing some custom uh, you know, mesh transformation thing in the CPU, you're doing a lot of really heavy math for some tool or something, and you want to have that run really fast, you might consider using this structure of arrays. But for your general game code, array of structures, and by that I just mean you have a VEC4 type that has an XYZW in it all you need. Don't worry about doing anything, uh, anything fancier than that. Uh, so there's, there's an article here you guys can search for. It just goes into explaining it, showing you the benchmark, showing you why it works, explaining it in detail. If you guys like prettier pictures than the two I put in here, uh, this is a good link for you. There's others too. So another, another neat trick with optimizing, return li uh, with re optimizing math libraries is a return value, particularly with SIMD operations. Uh, so there is a hidden performance penalty in this very, very simple line of code here. Uh, we're taking two vectors, we're taking the dot product, and we're scaling another vector by that dot product. This is a really common operation. Most of the times when you're using a dot product in 3D math, you're going to multiply that dot product by another vector. You're not just going to use a dot product itself. It's fairly rare. Uh, so the problem here is that the dot product intrinsically returns a scalar, returns a single floating point value. Uh, SSC math only works on vectors. You can't, with SSC, you can't multiply a, fo a float by a vector. You have to load a float into a vector. You've got to take that single float and copy it into all four locations of the vector, which are instructions to do that. And then you can multiply the two vectors together. Uh, so if we are taking an operation like the, say, the DPPS instruction that can, does the dot product for us automatically, which returns a vector, where all four components of that vector have the dot product in it for easy multiplication. We take the return value and then we take just one of those out as a scalar to return it as a float in our C, C++ API. We then pass it into another function, our multiply function, which takes that float and copies it back into another vector and then does the multiply. That's really wasteful. And you can see here, uh, if we just compute the dot product and then multiply the dot product by another vector, this is do instructions. On the other hand, if we, if we assume we're returning a scalar and we actually have functions that are returning floats and passing into floats, it's at absolute minimum five instructions. It's actually going to be more than this in real code. Uh, so two instructions, five instructions. I leave it to you to determine which one's going to be faster. Uh, yeah, so the trick here is to have a version of your dot product that actually returns a vector. And this seems kind of weird. You know, the dot product returns a float, it returns a scalar. What does the vector even mean? All the vector is, it's a vector that has this, the, the value of the dot product in all four components. And that just means you can now multiply it by other vectors with, an SS, with the SSE instructions super quick without having to do those extra copies. Uh, and I think you will find that this version that returns a vector is used more often than the version that returns just a float. Because most of the times that we have a dot product, we're multiplying it by another vector. We're doing uh, you know, projections or something like that. Uh, so you, when, you're, when you're looking at this now, this interesting case where we have the dot function or method, whichever you wanted to use, 
But now we have the version that returns a scalar, because we do need that sometimes. And we got the version that returns a vector, all these different names. Uh, you know, which one could you use? This goes back to the naming slides earlier. It doesn't matter. Be consistent. I, I would say usually optimize for the common case. But here, I, I wouldn't just have the dot return a vector. That's going to be confusing to people. I would maybe either, I would name them differently. Very clearly indicate that one returns a scalar, one returns a vector. And if you want to have the short version, make that be the version that returns a scalar. Uh, that's probably just the right choice. Just you have to be careful. The reason you might argue against that is that the version returns a scalar, your operators that you overload for your vectors, you're going to have a version of your multiply operator that takes a float and multiplies it by a vector and does all that extra work because you're going to need that in quite a few cases. So if you just have, if you just have dot return the float, it's going to silently compile. It won't look obvious that it's slow. It won't give a warning that it's slower. That's, that's one of the hard parts of API design and we just got to use judgment and taste. Um, there's some other interesting facts about VEC4. VEC4, VEC4 has a lot of interesting uses in a 3D app. Uh, so one thing is that we, we often use a VEC4 in place of a VEC3. Uh, and this isn't just for the, the fine transformations. Uh, there, there are certain things where we want to use a VEC4 for optimization reasons. For example, SSE. The SSE registers are only 128 bits. They are always four floats. They are never three floats or two floats. They are always four. If you have three floats, you have this like nice compressed transform that only stores an X, Y, and Z, loading that into an SSE register is actually somewhat hard because uh, the only operations that exist copy four floats. And if you only have three, then you're copying what garbage memory or something else. It, it's actually a huge pain. Uh, so in a lot of cases, you want to use VEC4s if you're not worried about memory, even if you actually only want a VEC3. Uh, you don't actually want the fourth component. Uh, so it can be really useful then to be able to compute the cross product on a VEC4. But again, that doesn't mean anything. So the cross product for a VEC4 actually just pretends it's a VEC3. It just ignores the fourth component. Uh, the return value returns a VEC4, but it just returns zero or whatever value it is you think uh, is best. Point is, uh, you're going to be treating the VEC4 as if it was a VEC3. Uh, same thing goes for matrix multiplication. Um, you might, you know, you might have this VEC4 where that fourth component, that W component, actually isn't supposed to be part of the vector. Maybe it's a, it's a vertex buffer. You're really compressing the amount of memory you're using, and you're, you've stuffed some other value in there. But you want to do some math on it. You want to do a, a transform from a matrix. You want to do this matrix multiplication, but you want to have a version of the function that says, just ignore the fourth component, pretend it's 0. Or maybe another version you say, ignore the fourth component, pretend it's 1. Because you don't want these extra copies, because in SSE, that's a pain and it's slow. Uh, the same thing goes for magnitude, normalize. You might want a version of VEC4 normalize. It only normalizes based on the first three components, not the fourth. It only returns a length based on the first three components, not the fourth. These, uh, these are not super common, but they come up often enough that I have found them useful to make sure I always has, have them. And I even like the, uh, the actual instructions built in the CPU and built in the GPU are built around this assumption. Uh, the GPU in particular, the GPU only has VEC4s. Uh, SIMD in the CPU only has VEC4. So they, they assume you might want to be doing certain instructions where you're ignoring that fourth component. Uh, so quaternions. Uh, so we went over kind of, we're going to go over them. Uh, so quaternions are an extension of complex numbers. Uh, if you guys are familiar with complex numbers, you've got the real part, the imaginary part. Uh, quaternions just essentially have three imaginary parts on three different axes. It's a little weird. Um, you can actually just think of them as a three component vector and a scalar. Uh, that's it's actually the way they're defined normally. The three-component vector is the imaginary part, and the scalar is the real part. Um, quaternions can efficiently represent rotation in 3D space. The vector component represents the axis that you're rotating around, uh, scaled. Uh, so this goes into the, how the quaternion math works. Um, the scalar component represents the other half of this angle. The reason these are here, I am not going to even try to explain to you guys. The point is that there's a lot of really cool math that makes this work. We have an entire class here at DigiPen if you really want to dig into the guts of what quaternions do, how they work, why they work. Uh, if you are a math guy, that you know more power to you. I'm not. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that they're actually really easy to use. They, they understanding why they work might be you know might be something for a math major, for a programmer. You can get online, you can look at the formulas, you can plug them in, you can test them, you can write test cases, you can start rotating things with them, and they just work. They're they're really not that big of a fuss. You can actually start learning the basic properties of them. There's this, it's really a short list of the basic properties. It's an extension of, of basic math you're already familiar with. Uh, it's not really that scary at all. 
Uh, one thing to keep in mind is you want to normalize quaternions. This brings us, this is in almost all the guides and using quaternions for rotations, but a lot of people can, seem to keep forgetting this. This is a common error. Uh, the things that make quaternions really cool for rotations only work if the quaternion is normalized. Uh, yeah, it, it can also seem uh, tempting to just have a VEC4 instead of a custom quaternion class. Uh, quaternion is usually defined as having opponents x, y, z, and w. VEC4 is an x, y, z, and w. Seem like the same thing. The operations you perform in them are totally different. When you multiply two quaternions, they don't multiply the same way that two VEC4s would multiply together. They're, they're actually, there's actually a different uh, algorithm you use to multiply these together based on those properties of what actually the, the vector component and the scalar component mean. Uh, again, it's online, all how that works. Uh, so you're going to have totally different operator overloads. You're going to have some different uh, definitions. When you multiply a quaternion by a VEC4, there's another algorithm you use. There's algorithms for converting a quaternion into a rotation matrix or converting from a rotation matrix back into a quaternion. Uh, so they're different types. They might have the same data, totally different use case. Do not try to confuse things by having one type that does two things. Uh, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of articles about this. Um, if you're really interested in the math, take the class. I can explain tiny bits and pieces of it. I cannot explain all of it by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but using them is really easy. You do not have to be afraid of them. Running, putting quaternions in your math library. I had never even done anything more than hear of quaternions. And I wrote my first fully tested working quaternion math library in about two hours. And I was with writing all the matrix stuff to go with it. It really was not, not a huge time sink at all. Um, so math for graphics. Um, I'm not going to again go into the actual math you use, just more how you design a library to support these things. Uh, so OpenGL and Direct3D comes up a lot. There's actually not a whole lot of difference. Uh, OpenGL and Direct3D are not some weird incompatible APIs. They just express things a little bit differently and confuse people with weird terminology. So some of that weird terminology. Uh, Direct3D math is usually expressed using a left-handed coordinate system, using row major matrices, and using a, what I call pre-multiplication. So essentially what that means is uh, left-handed essentially means that the, the, Z the Z axis is going to be positive Z going away from you, whereas OpenGL's left-handed or right-hand coordinate system has Z positive coming towards you. Uh, so a little bit of difference there. The row major versus column major, essentially that means when you have your matrix and you say it's, got, it's a matrix of three by four, well, is the three columns or rows? Is the four, it's, all that means with row major is that the first number is your row, second number is number of columns. Uh, most of your math classes, you will be using row major. OpenGL uses column major, and there's reasons for that. Pre-multiplication versus post-multiplication. Pre-multiplication means if you want to multiply a vector by a matrix, with pre-multiplication, the vector goes on the left-hand side. With post-multiplication, the vector goes on the right-hand side. So this is where things get a little confusing. In the most of your math classes, you will be seeing row major matrices using post-multiplication. Uh, in the APIs, do it, do it backwards. They either use pre-multiplication row major, post-multiplication column major. There are reasons for that in terms of optimization back when these APIs were first put together. Um, the really cool trick, though, is that they're actually compatible. If you have row major matrices and you set things up for pre-multiplication, the actual layout in memory of the matrices will be the exact same as if you set them up column major uh, configured for post-multiplication. So what that means is if you have a math library written for OpenGL and you generate matrices with it, you can pass it to Direct3D and other way around. You don't need to transpose it. You don't need to do any weird, crazy stuff. They just actually work. Um, and in, even things for like the handedness, Direct3D and OpenGL don't care if it's left-handed or right-handed. The functions they come with by default configure things to be one way or the other, but they're, they're just matrix multiplication. You can use whichever version you want. You can create a totally crazy new coordinate system where Z is up and X is to the right or to the left and it, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Don't actually do that, though. Use, use one of the normal ones, please. But, uh, yeah, so the row, the row major matrices always use pre-multiplication. If you're using column major matrices, use post-multiplication. And the only reason for that, again, goes back to it keeps them compatible in memory. It, it is what the GPU expects. If you want to make a math library that looks more like how you're used to doing it on paper, we're using row major and post-multiplication. You're going to have to do the extra work of transposing the matrix when you pass in the light. There's extra work you have to do. Just get used to one way or the other. And... Uh, yeah, it, it, takes a, it takes a little bit of learning if you haven't written this code in C++ before, but it's not a big deal. Um, yeah, and it just ensures that they're compatible. 
Um, they don't care about headedness. Uh, there's some coordinate system stuff to worry about. So GL and D3D use different origin coordinate systems. Uh, so what that means is where 0, 0 is. And the talk I went over on 2D graphics, I mentioned that briefly. Uh, but for OpenGL, uh, 0, 0 is bottom left corner, Direct3D, it is upper left corner. This can be kind of confusing, because now it means which way is positive Y in certain cases. Uh, there's also the other big one is depth buffers. Uh, so in, in OpenGL, your depth buffer ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. In Direct3D, it's 0 to 1. What this means is that when you're looking at your, your functions to create your projection matrices, which is the stuff you go over in uh, CS250, uh, they're going to be slightly different if you're configured for Direct3D or OpenGL. Which it, it's kind of a bummer. You kind of want to write this one function that works for both. And with the default configuration, you can't. Uh, thankfully, you can actually tell OpenGL to use 0 to positive 1, at which point you can then just use the same version you'd use for Dark 3D and everything's happy at that point. Uh, there, and for, the, for this issue, you can just keep in mind that if you're using OpenGL, you need to toss in a multiply by the negative y into your matrix, so it just flips things, and you're good to go. Um, it's really annoying. I, I ran this uh, a couple years back. I was trying to write the generic math library, and this one just annoyed the crap out of me because I ended up having functions for right-handed and left-handed, and then right-handed Direct3D, right-handed OpenGL, left-handed Direct3D, left-handed OpenGL. Even though nobody does left-handed OpenGL or right-handed Direct3D, it, uh, I, if you like generic code, this one will thwart you, but there's not a lot you can do about that. Uh, so if any of that was confusing, I realize that's confusing because I am constantly confused by that. So I wrote an article that just explains it all in excruciatingly boring detail. If you are confused by it, you can look up the article. Uh, it's on my website. It just explains what all these terms mean, why they work or don't work in various ways. Uh, I actually look back at the article myself from time to time because I can never, there's too many terms and I always get them mixed up in my head. Uh, so geometric math. This is another f uh, feature of a math library that you may or may not need. Um, it's something you should, you're actually going to need to worry about here at DigiPen especially, though. Uh, so the, the geometric math uh, library. So most of your rendering is going to happen in the GPU. You don't need to worry about doing a whole lot of rendering tasks on the CPU itself. Uh, you will sometimes have to deal with spatial data structures. So if you want to optimize, uh, you have 10,000 objects in your scene, the CPU has to decide which ones it's going to tell the GPU to draw. It has to some algorithm, some data structure to keep track of this, pass those things in. Uh, that's going to require a lot of math, a lot of geometric math to build these data structures and optimize these structures. So you're going to need code in your CPU side to deal with all these things. Uh, if you're doing any physics, that is still generally run on the CPU today. I know there's libraries for doing GPU physics. They're actually not super popular and used all that often. Uh, and then ray testing, your AI and your game logic is going to be doing just tons of this stuff. You need this to be super optimized. Uh, you need to understand the math for it. You need to have all the math routines to actually do it. Uh, so some important operations you're definitely going to need. You need little things like finding the distance between two objects. You have this line and you have this sphere over here. How far apart are they? It's pretty straightforward, but something you're going to need at some point. Uh, so the closest point uh, where they're intersecting, if I have a line and a plane, or a ray and a plane, especially for ray testing, where does that ray hit the plane? Which, if I've got four different spheres in the scene, and I shoot this ray out for my character, which sphere does it hit? Uh, these are really important routines you're going to want to have in your math library. Uh, so there's a book that we call the Orange Book. The, name, the, the actual name of the book is Real-Time Collision Detection. It is a fantastic book in the resource uh, on, this, on this topic. Uh, so it just goes over all the different algorithms you can use for different types of collision detection. Uh, some of the code samples can be a little obtuse, but they're he explains the math fairly well. Uh, there's, a few, there's, there's very, very few cases where I can point at something in this book and say there's a better way to do it than how the book does it. Uh, so if you don't actually own a copy of this, get it. Um, you're going to want this for a class later on in DigiPen that you have to take anyway. So go ahead and pick up that book. Uh, yeah, and also, again, at DigiPen, uh, you, when you take CS350, the first assignment is to build a geometric library that you use because you're going to be doing those spatial data structures. Uh, I actually found that to be kind of a rough project only because we only had two weeks to do it. We had other classes and other obligations. It's kind of a short time to write all these geometric tests and then test them thoroughly. Uh, so if you're working in a math library now, now is a good time to go ahead and get a head start on that because you're going to need this code later on. And while those of the people are freaking out about this super hard project in the first two weeks of class, you can just sit there and be happy because you had it done you know, semesters ago. Uh, it's not super hard. It's just time consuming, especially the testing. You've got to write a lot of code to make sure all of your math is actually working properly. Testing. All right, so testing is 
kind of really important for the math lottery, more important than you might think, uh, more important than other aspects of the game engine, because other game engine bits, if they're not working, it's pretty obvious. If game objects don't load, they're not showing up in the engine. You know they're not working. With math, the errors can be a bit more subtle, uh, especially if, uh, if you're running a comprehensive math library and you're not actually using all of it right away. You go ahead and you write your math library and you write your cross product thing, but you didn't actually use it because you're not doing physics or graphics. And a month later, your physics or graphics programmer is writing his code, nothing's working, and he's banging his head on the desk trying to figure out why his code's not working. And oops, it's because your cross product function you wrote doesn't actually work correctly. It gives the wrong result. Uh, this, this is a huge problem. If you are writing a math library, you need to be testing the crap out of it. I mean, you need to make sure that every single function you, you write works, works properly, and it works in all cases correctly. Uh, so there's this thing called test-driven development. It's, it's really popular, not so much in the game industry, unfortunately, but uh, the idea here is that if you're going to write a new piece of code, instead of writing the code first, you write a test for it first. And of course the test doesn't run because it doesn't have any code to run on the test. But you have the test and you put in values that you know are correct. You've tested them against another math library. You've pulled them from some other source that has uh, you know, an existing set of tests you can run. You then write your code. And the more code you write, it just starts, your tests start passing. And you know that you're done running your math library when your tests pass at 100%. Better, you know that your math library is correct because your tests are all passing at 100%. There's no dumb errors that are going to pop out a month later. Uh, so writing tests is itself an art form. Uh, it, is not, it, it is not necessarily easy in a lot of cases. Uh, you're thinking you want to write a math library and you want to add two vectors together. So you just you create two random values, you add them together. Uh, there might be weird cases. For example, you might have a vector where the z component uh, isn't adding right because you had a typo in your add. And the vector you chose to use is 1001. And then the other one is 2001. So they're both 0 on the z component. It comes out 0, and it looks like it's correct. You didn't actually test all of your math library. You tested add, but you didn't have enough tests to make sure that all of it is working correctly. Uh, so you need to think about these things. And it can be really hard to wrap your head around what are all the different possible conditions I need to make sure work. Uh, there's also what are called boundary conditions. These don't come up quite so much in the math library. Uh, a good example, the, the, the standard example of a boundary condition is if you have a function that works with an array and the maximum size of the array is 1,000 elements, write a test for your function. What happens if you pass in 1,000 elements? Does that work? Is there an off by one error? What happens if you pass in 1,001 elements? Does it return the error code it's supposed to? Math library is a little bit rare. Uh, you might want to make sure, for instance, that uh, an assertion is thrown when you try to normalize a zero vector. Uh, that's, that's a good one to make sure that's working properly so you're not getting a bunch of weird uh, not a numbers showing up in your, your math library. Uh, but yeah, just writing all of these, it's, you have to be very exhaustive. You have to make sure that all the math tests you're writing are testing every last little corner of the math library. There are certain minds that are fantastic about, the, about this kind of stuff. They're the ones who any game you set them in front of, they find all the ways to break it and min-max it and you know, cheat at it every possible way. Programmers that have that skill are great at writing tests. Uh, Programmers, other programmers, not necessarily so great at, uh, at writing these. Uh, so yeah, the access line unit vector is a great case. They're, they're bad tests. You might have a test that uses an access line vector. You want to make sure those tests actually work. But you can't write a test that just uses 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then say, oh, I've tested it. It's, that's, you're not being complete at all. But, uh, yeah, one way to get test values, if you're, you're at, you know, at a loss of how to do these, is to just uh, use another math library, plug in a bunch of random values, see what it's spitting out, and now you know what values to test against. Uh, it seems kind of lazy, but gets the job done. Uh, you can also share test data. I, I, really, I, I know a lot of students kind of ask other people, hey, did you write a test case for your math library? And they share it. That's totally cool here. Um, just be aware that if you are getting someone else's test cases, that they're actually correct. Uh, if you get test cases and your tests are failing and you aren't sure that their, math, that their test cases they gave you were right, then your math might be totally correct, but you're sitting there wondering why your tests are failing because their tests are broken. Uh, so if you're going to borrow a test case from someone else, make sure their code's working. Make sure somebody you trust uh, to do a good job. Uh, and again, not all programmers are great test engineers. There's a reason that you know, companies like Microsoft have engineers of tests. I mean, it's, it's a specialized skill. Even very, very, very good programmers at things are bad at it. Uh, I know we have certain students here that go by the label super dev of uh, you know, Peter, so on and so forth. Not necessarily the best, uh, best people in the world at testing. I myself am absolutely horrible at writing tests. Uh, anyone who's worked with me can tell you the fact that you, you need a QA guy to go after me to make sure tests are working properly, because I do not do a good job of thinking of boundary conditions. 
Uh, and I have a feeling most other tech directors are going to be in a similar boat. So find someone, find someone who's good at this stuff and treat them properly. Uh, so summary, uh, keep it simple, design APIs for ease of correctness and usability. SIMD is great, uh, makes your math go faster, and test everything as much as possible. All right, questions? Awesome. All right. That means it was a perfect talk, clearly. <laughs> All right, thank you.